So I've gathered some of the brightest vines at Lean's Lodge at the Camp Cotoc Fishing Extravaganza. All women will point out. So there's a lot to talk about economy, markets. Let's start with the economy because we recently got the July jobs report. Philippa, when you look at these numbers, no real surprise, but how is the overall underlying health of the economy? Well, from the employment perspective, it's pretty good. It's, um, I'd say, on an even keel. We still don't see much in the way of wage growth, so that's going to be a problem in a consumption-based economy. What is this problem with wage growth? We've been saying forever that we're not seeing any wage growth. I think, well, uh, you know, a, a financial crisis is different from a garden variety recession. So this is very normal. The problem usually after a situation like that is deflation, not inflation. I think the concerns about inflation are misplaced. And workers are, I mean, if you go out and talk to people who have ordinary jobs, not, not in certain like high power jobs, but ordinary workers, they're still afraid of getting laid off. Yeah, I mean, I like to think about it as the trifurcation of the labor market, which I can't take credit for. Vadim Zlotnikov at Alliance Bernstein recently brought this up at a meeting. And he basically said, you've got a third of the workforce that is not in the workforce that could be. You've got a third of the workforce that is kind of marginally attached, part-timers, if you will. And then you've got another third of the workforce that has absolute pricing power. But because you have this, these, these different markets, they move... You take the average and you see very little in the way of wage growth. What does this mean for the markets longer term? I mean, the markets hit new levels, people argue whether they're overvalued or not, but the underlying health of the economy determines where markets go, Katie. Yeah, I would agree with that. So in terms of what's the driver of a long-term trend, it is the macro story. It is the fundamental data that companies offer to us. I look at the market from a technical standpoint. So what I try to do is identify long-term and short-term trends. Lately, of course, we've been stuck in a range. So if you're looking at U.S. equities, the S&P 500, very much range-bound. And that range has been characterized by these pullbacks that generate such significant bearish sentiment. And in a way, from a contrarian perspective, that's actually under underpins the market and we've gotten this stealth correction behind the scenes where a lot of stocks are pretty well off of their 52-week uh, highs. So this correction has actually added to this oversold condition of the market despite the fact that the S&P 500 is range bound and this is all within the scope of a long-term bull market or long-term uptrend. So to me from a technical standpoint regardless of what the drivers are the long-term trends are still very much higher. I'm, I'm curious if I could jump in. What yeah. do you make of the breadth of the market? It seems like we're hearing more and more about a, a handful of stocks that are leading the, the, the market's way, and I, I think you're talking about the correction and the rest mm -hmm. of it. That's right. So the breadth is always the stuff of the bear case, right? Yeah. So there's these breadth divergences where you have a rally that isn't supported by expanding participation right. amongst the market participants. And that is sometimes an issue, sometimes it's not. What I think is more important is momentum. Mm -hmm. And so when does that matter enough such that it affects momentum? That's when I start to care about it. Um, the last time we had a pretty big negative divergence in the breadth data was late 2012. And while we did have a significant low then, it also preceded a massive right. up move. So in a way, it, it's tough because sometimes you can be too late once you finally identify these negative breadth divergences. And so many of them have been in place for so right. long, like the percentage of stocks sure. above their 200-day moving averages for one. So. Let's, let's step away from the U.S. just for a minute. When you see the big picture globally, what's going on outside the U.S. that might in turn impact our markets and our economy? I think um, if the U.S. is the global locomotive and you're hearing that there's no wage inflation, there's no boom in the U.S., the picture outside is even less cheery. And there's just a global deficiency of aggregate demand, whether you're looking in um, China, Europe, Japan, the rest of the developing world. There's no obvious locomotive or impulse for pricing power um, into the U.S. And, and I guess one of the transmission mechanisms for this deflationary pulse into the States is the strength of the U.S. dollar. Yeah. A lot of people in the U.S., aren't too, cons you know, don't think about the currency that much, but um, there's, you know, deflationary impact on core goods, and of course the Fed um, ultimately has this price stability mandate, and they've got wind in their face from achieving that um, with, with every move up in the dollar. Um, and, and it's playing out in the commodities complex. I was just going to say that well, the commodities have just nosedived. I mean, this is what's interesting, too, when we think about what is next for the Fed because you see these prices going to levels we haven't seen in years. Yeah, I mean, Brazil's not a small economy. No. I mean, yeah. you, you look at a, a, at a graph of, of the real and you're just, it's, it's astonishing.
and they're you know raising rates and the rails making new lows. Um, that's it's I a think battle of the central bankers. It I mean, it really is. So, will the Fed raise rates next month? That could be a TV show. <laughs> oh, yeah, it a could be a series TV in and of show. itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, the the Fed has announced that it's data dependent, and as a former insider, uh, I, I can tell you that there were quite a few of us who didn't want to back ourselves into that tight of a corner, mm -hmm. uh, because now you're at the you're you're at the whim of the markets. There was a recent uh, ECI report, employment cost index report, that came out that that. The, the market was dead set. The Fed's going on September the 17th, period end. And you get one report that comes out and everybody goes back and they say, no. But, but data dependent means that the, the Fed's policy making function in and of itself has become extremely volatile. So, Philippa, what do you think about that in terms of what we see next month? Oh, based you mean on, from the Fed? Or, yeah, based um, on some of these concerns we're raising. You know what? I am sorry. I, I'm so tired of waiting on this issue because they have to get off the dime. And I happen to, I mean, my point of view is that we really need something from the fiscal side. And they've been carrying the whole weight themselves. Mm -hmm. And, but it's, it's just time to move on. And it's, it's time to, I mean, the, we don't know what would have happened without low rates, without QE. But we do know that enough of it is not translating into the workforce. Right. I mean, I really care about the health of the American workforce. Um, so I just think we need to get over this, stop being so focused on it, and just see what happens. I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I remember hearing, I remember reading this, but then I couldn't find it again. Uh, but I recall that Janet Yellen said over the last month or two that some of the other countries had moved and then they had to backtrack. And I think, did you remember? And yes. yes. So she, okay, good, thanks. Sweden, so, Europe, I mean, and Japan? She yep. even right. said <laughs> that. Name a few. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just like, okay, yeah, we're going we're gonna to move. Someone um, was suggesting maybe they should move like 0.15, just yes. something to keep the market calm. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, she's given them everything, including we could go back. So but, let's but just you, do it I mean, consider what what's happened. Forget the poor American saver for a minute and that Swiss Re report that said that they've foregone some half a trillion dollars in interest income since, we, since the Fed lowered interest rates to the zero bound. Uh, but consider the money market fund industry. I mean, they're effectively running at a loss. Yeah. And we don't know what the short rate market's gonna behave like because it's been so long since we've raised interest rates. I mean, if you consider the fact that you get $50 billion a day in Fed funds trading, that's nothing. So all of the overnight rate setting mechanisms are completely atrophied and for mechanistic reasons I think the Fed needs to come off the floor. I think that's interesting Katie if you could weigh in on the market side because you know, this is such an unprecedented 10 years almost that we've gone through <laughs> so now the Fed is going to try to get back in the game do we even have any good sense of how the markets react they're supposed to be prepared right that's the new fed they're letting us know what's going on everyone's going to be prepared but some of the issues and on the, the market's not side. priced though the fed keeps saying we're going to raise rates and the, the swap curve tells you that it's sort of the market's calling the fed's bluff yeah the market doesn't well that's believe. right and that's often the case i think our, our chief strategist has done some work on this and i believe there's four instances that he sort of could compare to the current environment albeit not perfectly right. mm -hmm. and that uh, typically it would be a run-up in the stock market and a correction following um, that correction tends to be somewhat swift and to me a swift correction is actually a healthy development, right? You, what you don't want are the slow grinds lower on back of something like that. It, it is funny and interesting that you do get that run up ahead of it, despite the fact that everyone seems to know what's coming. Right. Um, and yet sometimes you, you just see the same market behavioral, it's behavioral finance, um, you know, it just sort of manifests itself in that, that up move. And the subsequent correction is usually a buying opportunity. And if you believe in the bull market, then you should be, you know, looking for that opportunity. September, October, seasonally, that makes sense as well, right? Do you find it odd that equity market volatility is still relatively medicated? If you look at the bond market, That's the a currency good word, market, <laughs> <laughs> the the bond market, the currency market, the commodity market, volatility in all those spaces has seems to be. Um, alive to the concept that there's uncertainty around policy, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but the stock market is, is still um, so zen. Steady. So, Isn't that wild? so yeah. uh, what is it? You're a veritable dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> it's early I for don't this. Know, but this <laughs> is, <laughs> something that Her coffee was better than <laughs> us, yeah. clearly. Something that, um, that we talk about all the time, that I think anyone who thinks they can handicap how the global market will respond to the first hike mm -hmm. um, in, in nine years, um, 
Well, it's I'd hard like to know you, what, what, what playbook I mean, they're looking exactly. for. We part don't have part a playbook. of the challenge is you yeah. can't find a historic precedent right. to go back on. I mean, this is not going to be a regular, how does the market react when the Fed initially That's raises right. rates? Let's check that in the book. Ex yeah. There is no Well, actually, precedent. that was the point that I was thinking about, because if, if you watch the the academic writing that supports mm -hmm. the Fed, the guys who they listen to, you know, just the that whole series, you saw each thing happen, and finally, it was two years ago at Jackson Hole, a bunch of people came out with papers, okay, we never wanted to know about the zero bound. We wondered about it. It was of academic interest, and now, wow, we're there. And they basically said, we don't know what we're doing. One of the, I think, Wolford said, um, they found that Q, they they were wondering that they they were showing that QE really wasn't doing anything for the unemployment rate, but you could see these people working, struggling with something that they always wondered about and never wanted to know. And so we really are in a situation like that. Well, it's become a rather large what eleven, twelve trillion dollar experiment at this point. Yeah, I mean we're we're seeing. And levels. growing, if you think about all the other central oh. banks that are well, I'm, 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 I'm talking global. Yeah. 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 It just feels so dangerous when you look at some of these numbers. I think of what the Fed has been trying to do with QE for years, and it almost seems like it was a little too easy. Like, why hasn't anything blown up yet? We're almost overdue for something well, I, negative. Just wait. <laughs> well, so, I, I've come up with a nickname for this, by the way, and I doubt that the Fed would want to call it this, but I call it the Great Moderation, moderation Part 2. And we know how the great moderation part one ended, but I mean, but you're right. When, when you when you just stroll along, assuming that you've that the Fed has slayed the business cycle again, I mean, these things they, they just they don't are, end well. Are we over the conversation of the downturn in the economy being cyclical or structural? Are those questions still out there? Do you think, in terms of the employment issue, um, they will always be out there. But you know, when this whole thing about structural unemployment started, we're thinking, okay. Here we are, everything's fine, everything's correlated. Uh-oh, 2008, boom. Oh, how can you look at that? How can you see all of those people lose their jobs and say it's structural when it happened concurrently with the recession? And Coach Lakota, who was the one who started that, he backtracked, and I actually saw him at a con conference, and I said, you know, I have a lot of respect for you because you, you changed your mind and you said that. And he said, the data told me to. So that's, that's what we need, people who are looking at the data, who are making mistakes, and then saying, okay, I made a mistake. What's, what's the one ba data point that scares you, just so, kind of on a daily basis? Yours so, might involve a boat. Yes, mine does involve a boat. <laughs> the, 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 the debt markets scare the, I mean, it, it's a 200 trillion and counting market, and so much of it, if you consider what the $6.4 trillion Chinese local currency debt market. I mean, so much of the debt market is a black box. We don't know about the debt market. We, we weren't planning on the melt up on October the 15th in the treasury market, in the risk free market. The, the corporate debt market in the United States has doubled in the past few years. I mean, it's just, and yet regulation has gone the exact opposite direction. And so I, I worry about what the next hiccup might be in the bond market because it's so big you just it's it's hard to identify where that stressor's going to come from at this point which and is it, why your piece about needing a bigger boat you, we're going to we are going to yeah. need a bigger boat so, i'm happy this is a lake there's no sharks out there <laughs> so katie what what is it that's really kind of worrying you a little bit here if anything when i look at the monthly charts the the gauge of momentum that i use has actually turned negative for the s&p 500 and that is something to make a note of. Certainly it creates a different environment or backdrop than we had in that 2013, early 14 period. And yet it really hasn't had a toll or taken its toll on the, you know, the average stock, so to speak. So um, the Russell 2000, which represents small caps, has weathered that same loss of momentum very well and still managed to reach new highs. So to me, we make a note of it, sort of file it in the potentially bearish camp and just be mindful of support levels because that's the best we can do. Philippa. Student college debt. Mm. It's, I mean, what we're saddling our kids with is disgusting. And uh, the New York Fed just had a study that came out right after Danielle had written something for us um, where they were showing that a lot of the increases in the loan balances are going into raised tuition and especially at the less than two year um, 
colleges, the hairstyling schools and stuff like that, where those kids are, those schools are actually lying to them about what they're going to do. Debt without, debt mortgage with, without a house. Debt without a yeah. purpose. <laughs> and they're under, you know, they're under federal investigation for yeah. what they've done. So that, I mean, it's just ridiculous in a country like this to have our kids coming out of college with that kind of burden. Caroline? Um, I worry about, similar to Danielle, buildup of debt, um, external debt to yep. the emerging world mm -hmm. and um, the impact of, of tightening liquidity from rising dollar potentially. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the, the, look at the global ISM yeah. chart, you just like, it's pretty. Are, it's pretty. Are grim. we decoupled permanently? And, uh, Is this an indefinite yeah. decoupling? And the pace of a, the pace of accumulation of debt, um, I think, is is difficult to imagine that all that capital was uh, allocated so productively. But didn't the central banks make that okay? Um, I'm talking about all the countries that haven't done QE, where all the capital, the repressed capital, was fleeing. Right. Mm. So the emerging world, and um, you know, you don't necessarily need to have some apocalypse, but you could have a a lot of pressure and a big risk off trade. If that yeah, especially comes considering to the retail floor. ownership yeah. in the United States of all of these emerging oh. market mutual funds that they, you know, that their advisors just are looking telling for them, the biggest yeah, this is a good source of diversification retail. for your portfolio. Yeah, and here's, here's your carry. Go, when the go retail that guys coupon. are getting at your thing, yeah. you have to think, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. And, and we've yet to see really um, any outflows. From, from a lot of Truly. that space. And I, I, I can tell you the Fed's got their eye on this. The retail ownership of high yielding funds and its proliferation into ETFs yeah. and mutual. And again, this perception on the part of investors that this is gonna indemnify my portfolio. This is gonna, this is gonna hedge my equity exposure because that's what they're being told because that's what the playbook says. They just don't know it's a $200 trillion debt market that they're playing with. And it, these are typically um, daily liquidity funds, but the assets in them are long duration. So there's a big mismatch there too. Yeah. So let me throw another question at you guys. Um, without getting political here and talking about candidates, let's talk about the number one issue that the next president should focus on that would be helpful to the economy. Because yeah, we're going to hear a lot over the next weeks, months, it's going to go on forever. So what should, should they be talking about student debt? Should that be the I issue? I think they should do something about student debt. Um, I also think, and this is not a popular position, but I think we need a targeted jobs program. Um, there are, People are coming back into the labor force. There are people who are out forever, but there are others who could come back in. There are a lot of kids graduating who have yeah. nowhere think, to go. Think about the Scandinavians and some of the programs that they've implement, implemented. Then, r rather than 99 weeks of unemployment insurance, maybe we should have given people a new, a new skill, mm -hmm. an associate's it's, degree of some yeah, kind. Why have people, anyone who says they'd rather clip an entitlement coupon than have a job, that's just not the case. Yeah. If, I mean, yeah, everyone are, would rather be working and earning yes, their coupon properly. Yes, and it's very hard to live on any of these benefits. Yeah. They're not big. Yeah. Right. And, and our, of course, you know, the longer you're on them, the harder it is the to get back yeah. to the... I mean, you know, but one of my more friends who's an architect, a really talented woman, bilingual, beautiful, funny. She was going door to door with her resume in New York City for years. She finally has a job. She got a raise. She's doing great. But it was like three years. Yeah. She was not going to be clipping coupons. You know, and I think on a more fundamental level, you know, I, I, I look at the pension system. I look at a lot of these states that are under stress. And you consider what is going on in our educational system. And we angst about the fact that our kids get too many liberal arts degrees and there are, we don't have enough engineers. I mean, that's just a symptom. Underlying all of this is an educational system that needs radical reform. And that's a huge nut for a politician to take on. I don't care which party you're talking about, but it really needs to be addressed. Yeah from the Canadian perspective of, <laughs> but what are some issues that you think? You're unruly yeah. neighbors. Yeah. Well, yeah. We just, we've also just, we have a federal election in the fall in Canada. I will point out that the 11 week campaign is oh. quite <laughs> civilized. That's different than the US. US. Um, <laughs> but, uh, fresh, right? You know, we're, we're, so facing, nice. yeah. Yeah, we're, we're facing similar issues, although um, just the reality of the, the commodity meltdown is, really Canada exposing, problem, it's yeah. exposing um, the lack of diversification in the economy and back to the issue of right. jobs, skills, you know, where's your competitive edge? And so the end of the commodity super cycle, oxygen supply has been right. cut off. Yeah. Um, and, and we're starting to feel that all over again in Texas where I am because I think most of the world was hoping that we would go from 60 to 70 
instead of from 60 back to 44 or wherever we are, you know, right now. And so now you're starting to see a second round of layoffs coming out of the energy sector. And that can't be good because no. so many of the jobs that have been created during the shale revolution have been so high paying. That's right. And, then and that gets, us back, that gets us back to where we started, yeah. right? Which right. is which is Waitrose. Yeah. And my spy in, in your state um, is, was telling me this week that a lot of the jobs, you know, they're keeping up job growth, but they're moving from manufacturing support for drilling and drilling to leisure and hospitality. So they're moving down the pace. We've, we've, we've read this and book they're, before. They're, yeah. they're, they're this seeing it more as a concern for sales tax receipts, which are important also to education. Well, we didn't solve any issues here. <laughs> we tried. We, we, we made them work. We brought, <laughs> Identified. We brought a lot <laughs> to light. And it's been great chatting with you. And I'm going to let you all go fishing. Thanks. Thank so you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.